is coming back with the question to this kind of question. This is really wonderful is, is, uh, is the maximum uh, cross section. I mean, yeah. if they're two and you mentioned Is it the only difference? For this one? Yes. No, I mean, this one, the only requirement is isolated. This is more general for this. Yeah, okay, but, but uh, so here it's possible that the reaction will is not standard in the sense of no, 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 standard. Look for the standard. Oh yeah, there's a lot of duplicity. Well, it's not just. I'm not sure what you mean. So I think the main, one of the main ways in which this is much more general is that the dimension of the torus yes. does not have to be, which, which we discussed briefly yesterday. Yeah, and right? I understand, I understand why, how it can be isolated. I understand this, but I want to know, okay, now suppose that this dimension is matches, it's half a dimension. Oh, that it is half yes. a dimension. So I, want, I want to understand the difference, what is more general. So there's this multiplicity that can come, and, and also the and this condition it's close multiplicity, right? I mean, each uh, isotropic weights are pairwise pairwise linearly dependent. So, you don't have, uh, so I can't have any multiples. Yeah, any multiples. So all these all these isotropy, I mean the. The reducible representations are all different. So does that mean that finally this chorus is acting in the standard way in the sense of the standard way? So I think we agreed yesterday no, right? Because you agreed with me that if I have a weight five then that should be different with weight one, yeah. um, topologically. You, you were happy with that statement. Um, and here, I don't uh, rule out the possibility that I could have uh, some multiples of primitive weights. Yeah? So at least in that way, it, is, it really is different from the standard action. And I could have something fundamentally different from the standard action. Does it make you know, sense? The difference is the global quotient compared to, say, quasi-tolic manifold, the global quotient is a simple torus. In this case, it's no, we don't know what that is. Uh, I torus. personally, I, so if you tell me a manifold is GKM, and, and you tell me that the dimension is half the torus, the torus dimension is half the dimension of the manifold, and then you ask me, okay, what is the quotient space? Then I don't know. Maybe somebody has thought about it, but I personally don't know the answer. No, but imagine um, some sort of manifold, single manifold quotient. Uh, but there's no before the... Uh, Maybe. Uh, I mean, I wonder, I'd like to have yeah, I, yeah, I don't, but I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know. Have you seen injective also? Uh, this will, um, let's see. I think this implies injective. Or if it's functions? yeah, I think I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. I think so, but I <sighs> let's assume injective. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I was I thought maybe if you assume injectivity over two, then maybe that portion is familiar. Ooh, right, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, you think? The torus has half the region. Oh, I see. Mm. Mm. Not sure. Not sure. Not sure. <laughs> it's, something, it's something to think about. <laughs> I think you can draw some conclusion about that. It would be interesting. Yeah, it would be. Injective gives us assumption one and two. 
Yeah. Well, so uh, and and the assumption that Dan wants that the dimension is half the dimension. Okay, yeah, yeah. So then the question is, we are just trying to formulate an actual question that one person in this room should work on, um, <laughs> which should not be me right now. <laughs> but <laughs> so assume the so assume. Yeah. And assume these. Assume, these. assume the torus is half the dimension. What's the quotient? What's what is what is what is it? Do you get anything more than quasi toric? So I don't know. So I don't think we know the answer. This is more. In general, it's certainly more general. Even, yes. I think even for half dimension, I think you you you, yeah, you at least have the equivalent of. Uh, I mean, you have no reason to have a simple polytope of the ocean because you can have something that would be a manifold corners, locally simple, but globally it's not a polytope. That's, that's for sure. But I want to know if you can have more. That's a, that's a force manifold, isn't it? Force manifold have. The back of the map is Mickey and It's not a Force manifold is more general. I mean, it, it doesn't understand more data, I think. <coughs> but uh, what about... For Masuda's, for Masuda's Masuda, torus? Uh, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. They are assuming that they are half-dimensional torus acting and uh, isolated points. And so what else are they are assuming? Are they No, and torus manifold. Torus manifold? Yes. That might be all. That might be all, so... We well, should have Masada so Sensei the, here. So <laughs> I think assuming that ocean space is, all the space is, uh, is that manifold with yeah, cones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They assume that? Well, um, there's some layers, right? If you assume standard action, then it becomes like good corner of manifold or something. Yeah. Like that. Hmm. <laughs> we can discuss this uh, what, whatever week we are in Osaka <laughs> with Master Sensei. Okay. Um, okay, but in general, this is certainly more general than uh, the, the Taurus manifolds under discussion. Okay. Um, very good. So now um, I want to discuss um, an equivalent formulation. So another way to say this is exactly that the the equivalent one skeleton. So that's um, by definition those points that have the property that the dimension of the orbit is less than one dimensional. Here I mean the real dimension. I'm doing the real compact torus acting. Um, and this is my notation for a T orbit. Okay, so the so I'm not done with my sentence uh, is real two dimensional. So with some compactness assumptions, which is to say that everything actually uh, closes up. Um, so M1 is going to look like a union of two spheres. So these two spheres come equipped with T action. which is exactly given by, um, so, so this is of course a T invariant subset. 
and so T acts on it, and on each sphere, so so the so the spheres that sit in that sit between the fixed points, these have a non-trivial T action. Yeah, that's pretty much by definition. If I'm not a fixed point, then I do have some non-trivial T action. Um, but because uh, most of the torus fixes me, there's only an S1's worth that actually moves, and that, that S1 is actually moving me by some weight. Um, and that's exactly being uh, recorded by the T isotropy weights. Okay, so uh, given by, precisely by, this weight alpha IP um, intersecting at the fixed points. So w when I say intersect, I'm saying that these two spheres intersect at, at T fixed points. So this is a it is often said that, in other words, another way to say all this is that the equivalent one skeleton just looks like uh, a, a many, many, many balloons, these circles just glued together at the north and south poles. So you get, um, you, so the picture is like this. So I have these fixed points, yeah, so these are my fixed points. Let me draw a few more, maybe if I can. Yeah, so, so you should think of these points are my T fixed points. And then, uh, so I'm drawing the real picture here. <laughs> Not uh, uh, Sorry, so here I'm trying to draw a two-dimensional sphere, like usual. And so this, so if I look at the tangent space, I'm, look, I'm seeing exactly a two-dimensional tangent space, which is a copy of C. So what I'm trying to draw here is one of my uh, complex one-dimensional spaces, which makes up my tangent space to the entire manifold. Um, and so here I'm looking at one of them, and um, and so this sphere corresponds precisely to one of those, uh, I, um, uh, sorry, um, irreducible T representations in my tangent space. And so, but but if I but so in the linear algebra and just at the tangent space, I just see this copy of C. But what I'm saying is, in the actual manifold, the C actually um, ends up closing off and uh, coming to another fixed point. And so you get uh, P1 or an S2. And of course, this happens at all of these points. Yeah. So this is so, and of course, I, so this is just a. Uh, uh, schematic picture, but you, this is the picture you are supposed to have in mind. And each of these spheres are being spun uh, precisely by that weight, by some weight. So maybe I should label things. So, so if I have a P here, and if this is my ith, uh, ith um, representation, then it will be act on by weight alpha P. Now here I need to say one thing. Uh, which it, it, is an, it is a technical but a, an annoying, but it is an issue that comes up, so I should make a footnote here. Um, uh, so when I say that there's uh, a weight, uh, an action here, well, I could, the, the issue is, a one, uh, is, I'm sorry, the issue is one of sign. So if I look from this fixed point and look at the sphere, um, then it will have one weight. But if I look at this point and look at the sphere, and I look, it will have the minus weight, the negative weight. So there is always an annoying issue about which sign do I mean. But thankfully, I, am, I will ignore that issue of sign because at, when I describe for you the equivalent cohomology, the issue of sign, it really doesn't matter for how I use this, this weight. So, so the sign really doesn't matter for us, so I will ignore it. But let me at least say it once. Um, so there is a sign ambiguity here which we will ignore. For the GKM description of the equivalent cohomology, the sign does not matter. Okay, very good. So that's just a quick comment. Okay, now. 
given this picture and what we have said, I can now, I hope this, it is motivated, I will define a combinatorial object. It's a graph, yes? Right, I need to get into this stuff. But this two-sphere yeah. is almost distinguished from Yes, yes. And that has complex structure from coming from this representation of the time. I think we agreed yesterday that I'm not assuming that. No, no, no. Right? All this two-sphere. Um, I mean, you, well, so you can always give it a complex right. structure. Yeah. I mean, it's an S2, right? So it is certainly a complex manifold. So the, I think the real question is, what, what's, the relation? what's the relation between that and something else that you may have originally had? Well, right. Take the complex structure on the Kantian space to the North Pole and South Pole. Where it comes mm -hmm. from this here this representation. So I so okay if so this is then, a real, then I think real representation, right? Yes. Yeah, so I mean outer IP is a way for complex representation. I mean well, so the real representation it doesn't really matter. As a real representation alpha i to a minus alpha i to as a real representation, they are equivalent. Right. But for a complex representation, they have a unitary representation. Yeah, right. So I think uh, alpha i to, you have to have some uh, design issue, but since you have... Since I don't care anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um. That's not the issue I'm asking. Um, you already have a complex structure on the quantum space at P to this sphere. So... It's a quantum space, at a quantum space. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm asking that complex structure at that quantum space mm -hmm. to use to give a complex structure on this sphere. So let's see, I think... Um, Yes. Um, the complex structure is just given at one point in the zone yeah. point, so it's so just an orientation. Right. Is it is it your question just extending this, this one to a complex structure on this scale? I mean you can get at 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 a point which you have a, let's say n spheres attached, right? At at one fixed point you have n spheres attached, that's equivalent to have the n-dimensional complex representation So, but uh, at that point, it's, I, I think it's, a, it's equivalent to saying you have a complex, you get complex structure and so the vector representation. So I think so. It's not so I think yes, it's yes. <laughs> okay. I think so. Yeah, I think it doesn't. Like, but yeah, the way it's focused yeah. on Yeah, I think. In the cases that I care about, mm -hmm. the complex structures, they're just there to begin with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah? So, so I, personally, I never worry about it. Yeah. But, so, so, but when your question is, well, in general, what can you do? I'm not, well, anyway, but, but in the examples I will show you, the complex structures, they are just there. Um, but anyway, I, but I think the answer is yes, as you suggested. Yes. Well, you skip how to contract this two sphere. Um, so I was wondering. This here, but was the smooth structure exactly restricted from the smooth structure of the manifold or the uh, No, they're, they're actually sitting there as smooth submanifolds. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Very good. Now let's. Now let me define the combinatorial. Um, gadget which we will use. Okay? So using this information okay, uh, let us define following combinatorial gadget. Okay? It's really very simple. And now here, I already said this yesterday, so I apologize to repeat, but he, today I will be more specific. Okay?
okay? I said yesterday the literature is a mess and terminology is inconsistent and so on. So I will be specific about that right now. Okay, so here, when I say something is a GCAM graph, I disagree with one of the foundational papers in the subject. <laughs> uh, Gilliman and Zara, 2001. Um, so I just warn you right now, okay? So uh, my uh, terminology, my terminology that I'm using net right now is inconsistent. Inconsistent with Okay, this was one of the first papers which actually took the ideas of Goreski, Kotwitz, McPherson and put it into the language with which I'm actually presenting to you this material. So it's really one of the first papers that really started the subject and yet I'm using terminology differently. So, so it's worth saying. Okay, now, definition. Okay, all right, so GKM graph, my GKM graph, Okay, has the following vertices, edges, and labels. Okay. Okay. So I'll call it gamma, vertices, edges, and certain labels. A set of labels alpha, one for each edge. Okay. Where? It's probably exactly what you already imagine it is. The vertices are precisely these isolated fixed points. Okay. The edges, I just take these spheres that are already sitting inside my manifold as nice sleuths of manifolds, connecting certain uh, fixed points. So whenever I see a sphere, I'll draw an edge. Okay, so edges um, will be, so just for notation, I'll write it as Paris PQ. Um, in MT cross MT precisely when there exists, so I just look at the geometric uh, thing that I have, my equivariant one skeleton, there exists an embedded S2 um, inside this picture um, with um, the two fixed points being precisely, in other words, I'm connecting, I am an S2 precisely connecting my two fixed points. Okay, so it's just, you just take those spheres and collapse them to edges so that you don't have to draw S2s all the time. Okay, and then we also label the edges um, with exactly the weight that is, is, is sitting there for us already. With the weight encoding the action on this. Yes. Okay? So it's, it's given what we have said so far, it's just a completely natural graph to build. Okay? All right, very good. So now, just a quick... Oh, yes. With the, yes. Do you really care about this? Yes, that's so what you I... You might have said absolutely or whatever. Uh, <laughs> because... Uh, so let's see, so... I, so uh, when you say I absolute value, uh, yeah, it's right, a, so it's... The weight is a, is a... I mean, I don't know what you mean by weight, but it's a sort of map from T to R. Just the... Uh, okay, so so okay, so so that is relevant for my next remark. I think about a weight as an element in the dual of the Lie algebra. So zero of the Lie algebra is just a t to t map from t to r. That's right, but 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 the dual of the Lie algebra is itself a vector space. Right, right. So 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 what I'm saying is I don't care about whether it points this way or this way right. for any. But but there's no way to there's no way to take uh, to take the absolute value. So that's the only reason why I don't say, but, but nevertheless, uh, I don't care about the sign. But what I will define next, it really doesn't matter which way it points. It's just the direction that matters. Given the Zara, are they 
So what they do is um, they they actually for each S2 they will give you two different edges. <laughs> yes, and they will label it with the sign and the minus and they are very careful to to keep track of, of this sign issue. But since I don't care, I only have one edge and one um, label which the sign I don't care. So but it's yeah. Anyway. It's somewhat technical, the distinction, but it can get confusing, so, okay. Um, very good. Uh, so now the remark uh, is that any, uh, so because I think about T weights, in the dual of the Lie algebra, uh, this is actually, Sitting inside the equivalent cohomology of a point. That's because I can think about this as the symmetric algebra on the dual of the Lie algebra. And so, so this is just sitting inside there as the degree two piece. It's the linear polynomials in uh, this ring of polynomials. Okay, so in so indeed alpha is a linear polynomial in U1 up to UN in my notation from yesterday. Okay? And that's relevant for what I say next. So here's the theorem of Goreski, Kotwitz, and McPherson with the footnote warning uh, that, well, maybe I don't do a footnote, I just write it here. Warning. They don't state it this way. If you look in their paper, they won't state it this way. This is what I meant when I said that Gilliman and Zara are the ones who extract from this paper a way of viewing it, which is this nice combinatorial picture. Yeah? I'm sorry? These guys are complex coefficients. Uh, I mean, the alpha is alpha. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I didn't understand. I'm sorry. Alpha is a linear With integer coefficients. <laughs> yes. But at the moment, I just, I just cared to say that it's in here. But you're absolutely right. It happens to have integer coefficients. Of course, because it's a weight. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Okay? But what I am about to say does follow um, from, very simply, from, from what they say. So it is always attributed to Goreski, Kowitz, McPherson. So here we go. Okay, so with all the assumptions that we have had, okay, so I, so I don't rewrite them, with all assumptions as above, And I now realize that I shouldn't try to write it here. I should give myself more space. Okay, I try to use... Okay, all right. Um, here's what it says. The image is precisely this. Oh, not... Uh, sorry, not isomorphic. Actually equals. Okay. Okay. It's those lists of polynomials. So, given a point P, oh, well, let me write it first. So, please remember, we agreed that the codomain of my I star is just um, the equivalent cohomology of my isolated points which is nothing else than just the sum for all of these isolated points of ht of a point. So, an element in that codomain is nothing else than a list of polynomials, one for every point. That's why I, I write it f sub p. I hope this is self-explanatory. Okay, and now, what does it mean to be an image? Well, here we go. I write down the conditions for you. It's those lists such that the weight, so I'm sorry for all this notation, but um, uh, I, just temporarily, please allow me to denote the weight course, uh, which decorates the edge PQ. That's a label. 
Yeah, so that's the label, but it's the weight. It's that weight of this S2 that we discussed. So depending on what I'm talking about, sometimes I have been calling it alpha IP, but now I call it alpha PQ. I hope it's okay. Okay, this must divide FP minus FQ in this polynomial ring. When I say divisibility, I mean in this polynomial ring, of course. Which is why it was important to, for me to say oh, but this is a linear polynomial, so this, ma- this statement makes sense, yeah? Uh, and this is for all edges PQ. Okay? So divisibility um, in the polynomial ring for every edge. Okay? And I hope you see, so divisibility, of course, it wouldn't matter with the sign. So that's why I don't care about the sign. Okay, so uh, just terminology again. These conditions, so there's a lot of conditions, one condition for every edge. These are often called the so-called GHAM conditions. So the way we talk about it, uh, if a list of polynomials satisfies the GKM conditions, then we know it comes from a global class on M. That's the way we say these things. <laughs> okay? All right. Now you have all been waiting, so let's just see some examples. Okay. So let's do the fundamental example, which informs everything else. And that's uh, when you only have one sphere, and the sphere is the manifold, S1 acting on S2. Okay, so let's think about S1 acting in the standard manner on S2, which I think of as P1, if you like. Okay, so this is my M, this is my T. Okay, then, of course, we know that this is, these are just the north and south poles. There is only one complex dimension's worth of tangent space, so of course they're pairwise linearly independent. There's no condition there. Okay, so, um, so of course it's a GKM, and the GKM graph is also very simple. But it is really worth to understand this one completely because after all, the general GKM graph is just putting together these ones. Okay, so it looks like this and the label is U. It's acting with weight 1, so it's just 1 times the generating variable. It's acting with weight 1. And that, of course, that weight 1 comes from the fact that it's the standard action. Okay? So now let's think about what this image is. Okay, so I will write it a little informally, but I think it's, I hope it is intuitive. Okay, so often uh, when you talk to people who do this uh, kind of thing, they will just draw the graph and then at every vertex they'll just label it with a polynomial just to how to think about it. Okay, so it's, so it's a list of two polynomials and we think of it as decorating these vertices such that u divides f of u minus g of u, i.e. they have the same constant term. That's what it means. Okay, so so that's 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 all it means. Okay, and this is please recall. This is the whole point. So that's the computation of the S1 equivalent cohomology of S2, and in particular, this means that we can actually write out very simply, for example, module generators for this equivalent cohomology ring as a module over HS1. So here we go. Let's do it. It's so simple. So let's see, so they have to have the same constant term. So there's a degree zero class that looks like that. It's just one one. Okay?
And another, the other one is, so I'll just put a zero there. So, um, so let's see, how can I say? So I'll put a zero there uh, without loss of generality. And please remember my label here is U, so I better put a multiple of U, and in fact it can just be U. Certainly that is in the image of I star by definition. And in fact, it's not hard to see that, that once you have these two, then anything of this form can be written as some polynomial linear combination of these two. That's not hard to see. Okay? Alright, so that's just one example to start. Okay? Alright, now let's do two more examples. Uh, in fact, um, at the very end of yesterday, I already put up this example, but let me put it again um, because there are some comments I want to make about it. So, um, example one, two. Uh, so this this was the decorated version of this uh, example. So I will not write out everything. Let me just give you the result that I want to see, that I want to show you. So here, of course, it is just a direct product of this example. So now instead of just having an integral, I have an integral cross an integral, so it's a square. Okay? Um, and if you do the same kind of thing, you will see that you have module generators as follows. So one, 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 one everywhere. That's the identity in the ring. So you had better have that. Okay. Um, and now, I'm sorry, I think I'm swapping orientation from what I wrote yesterday. Um, but let me use coordinates like this. So this direction is u1 and this direction is u2. Then, and by the way, there is a reason why I'm drawing it diagonally like this. Um, there is a reason. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, so, zero is zero, u2, u2. And then the last one is zero, 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 and then the product u1, u2. Okay? I'm sorry, I should have told you that the labels are exactly given by the directions of the edges. So this is u1, u1 uh, u2, u2, u1, etc. Those are the labels. Okay, so again, in this example, it's almost as simple as this. It's not hard to just convince yourself that this, this is a mod set of module generators. Okay, so why did I want to put this up? Because it's because uh, I wanted to make two remarks. So the first remark is, please note that an example I wrote up yesterday, please remember I told you yesterday I divide my discussion into part one, injectivity, and part two, Goreski, Kotwitz, McPherson, because some, sometimes only one applies and not two. Um, and, and at the end of part one yesterday, I gave the example of the diagonal S1 acting on S2 cross S2. There the injectivity holds, but it's not GKM. Um, nevertheless, I gave you a picture that looks very similar to this, and we wrote down some module generators. So in that previous example of S1 acting, <coughs> excuse me, diagonally on S2 cross S2, um, uh, obtained, uh, so the previous, previous examples, uh, module generators, are obtained from a very simple way using these sort of GKM theoretic module generators um, obtained through the very na through the projection from HT2 of a point to HS1 of a point where this S1, please remember, is sitting diagonally in the T2. Um, and so you just replace U1 by U and U2 by U. And then you will obtain the previous version for the previous example. And I'm mentioning this because this will be a theme that will crop up um, in what Juliana and I are doing. 
that you always want to exploit the fact that somehow uh, oftentimes uh, you have this larger torus that is somehow in the background. Okay, so that's why I mentioned this now. Okay, second remark is, as you may have noticed, and this is why I was drawing this somehow diagonally, uh, like tilted from the usual picture, is because I want to somehow make it intuitive that the way I have chosen my module generators, the way I have done it is precisely so that somehow I am ordering my fixed points in a certain way. Yeah, so I, I so this is coming motivationally from the Morse theory and symplectic geometry, although this is not necessary for the discussion. Okay, but the motivation is Morse theory. So you sort of think of this as the bottom fixed point, some minimum of some Morse function. Yeah? And then there's the top. And so there's some kind of linear or partial order on the fixed points. And I have arranged for my module generators so that, okay, so this one of course is non-zero at all points. I have to have that one. But then gradually I want to build module generators so that they are zero at the bottom and somehow increasingly they are zero as I push up. Okay? So what I'm aiming for uh, when I construct and I show you these particular module generators is exactly I want to give you generators that have a certain kind of upper triangularity property. Yeah? Just like in uh, first year linear algebra. Yeah? That's, it's always easier to do computations when things look nicely upper triangular when you want to solve systems of linear equations and so on. And, and for my generators I want similar computationally good properties. And so I'm just giving you an example of such a thing here and we will want to do this in general and the final thing to say here is that Schubert classes actually have that property of being upper triangular in a certain sense which I will make precise uh, later. Okay, so I'm sorry that's a lot of words, let me write something no, Yes. More words More words uh, more, uh, This upper triangularity Yes Is it the same as this order in vertices? Uh, okay, so, so in general it will be a partial order, not a linear order. And what I will want in general, if I have a partial order on the vertices, then in an ideal situation what I would like to have is the following. I have one module generator for every fixed point. Okay? And I want that module generator to have the following property. With respect to this partial order, this module generator should only be non-zero on points that are greater than me. Does it make sense? So I should, so I should look at the, 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 what is it called? In, I think in combinatorics it's called the upper order ideal or something like that for a partial order. It's just within a partial order, I, I have me, I'm in the set, and I look at all those points uh, which are greater than me. Okay, so it's the, so I just think of it as a cone coming, starting at me and going up. And I want to require, in an ideal world, what I would want is if I had a partial order on the fixed points, then I would want, uh, as I say, if, I, if, a mo if a model generator corresponds to me, then I should only be non-zero on those points that are, those fixed points that are greater than me, and zero out everywhere else, in particular in the lower than me. So this is the kind of uh, property that I would like to have for a model generator, simply because it makes computations easier. Just as in, yeah? Can you tell when you do or do not have an actual order? Uh, you mean an actual linear order? Uh, so for the examples that I will discuss, it is always possible to, I mean you can extend the partial order to a linear order. So you could, you could do it if you like, uh, but I think in the context of, of the flag varieties, which is what I will discuss, it's not, at least I don't see immediately right now, uh, that it would be particularly useful to extend it to a linear order. What do you mean extend uh, so I take the partial order and it may be that, uh, so I just define a linear order which is compatible with the partial order. Yeah? Um, so, so one could think about whether or not, uh, you know, you can do this in a nice way and so on. But what I'm saying right now is for, for what I have been thinking about, I don't think that it would be particularly useful to do so. So I, I have not personally done so. No, definitely not unique. No, no, it's, it's in general very, very, very not unique how you do this. 
uh, when you ext when you so-called extend a partial order to land. Very, very not unique. And and as I say, in, in my work, I don't bother to do it. Yeah. And your remark is, uh, as well as acting as food promises, too. Yes. And uh, you're acting like a uh, rate one and rate one in both cases. Yes. But it, it is on one side rate two and that side rate three will keep you as a good plan. Yes. And what does that do? Is positionally you want to... Uh, PU and U2 to QU. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So let me write down the remark um, and then we continue. Okay. So... So, th so this remark is philosophy, yeah? It's not mathematics, it's philosophy. We, maybe I, I write it this way, okay? So we would like to arrange model generators to have so because it is philosophy and not mathematics, I allow myself to be a little vague. Yeah. Uh, but the point is, you want increasing numbers of zeros as you go up. Okay, so, so that's why I drew it this way, so this is somehow intuitive. Okay, um, so this is a... Uh, oh, sorry, so this is because... Um, why? So, okay, this is because computationally easy to work with. That should not be surprising to any of us. Okay, um, so here, so this is a kind of, it's a kind of, so let's see. Um, we discuss in much more detail later um, this. So, Juliana and I have been calling it poset upper triangular, precisely because in general you just have a, a partial order structure on your on your uh, fixed points. So, it's not strictly upper triangular in a in a linear order sense, but at least it's poset upper triangular. Okay, and the final remark is Schubert classes have this property. And again, I, w I promise to be more specific later. Okay, so there's a reason why it shows up in what we do. Okay, and final example. Is um, okay. so we will talk about this more momentarily, but let me just put it up on the board. Okay, so these are um, nested sequences of subspecies. Oh, sorry, and of course the condition is that the i uh, subspace should have dimension i. Then the GCAM graph looks like this. So, you know what I should simply say here, preview of next section. I'm sorry? So what kind of action is I'm sorry, what yes. Okay, so here I'm thinking about the maximal torus inside of, say, U3. So flags in C3. So I have the usual diagonal torus acting on C3. And I say T2 just so I can draw the, 
draw the picture. Um, and so I will restrict to the torus, which is, uh, so, so just for this purpose, I, I can restrict to the torus, which is a special unitary. So T1, T2, T3 diagonal, where T1 times T2 times T3 is 1. So that's the, but the action is the simple one. I just think about this, uh, this torus, uh, sorry, I just think about this diagonal matrix as an element in GL3C. And I just move, I just translate these vector spaces by just multiplying by that linear transformation. Okay. But I will, in fact, maybe I should not, well, whatever. Uh, we say more about this specifically in a moment. Yeah, okay. Um, so it looks like, uh, as, looks as follows, and I will actually also give you an example of a GKM class. So it looks like this. Okay, so with these coordinates, um, so the, th these labels are u1, u1, this is u2, u2, and this is u1 plus u2, u1 plus u2. Um, and now I draw for you an example of a GKM class, 2u2, 2u2, u2, u2, and u1 plus 2u2, and u1 plus 2u2, and you can now check for yourselves that given this data, it actually satisfies the GKM conditions. So therefore, so because it satisfies the GKM conditions, it actually represents an equivalent homology class in flag C3. Okay, but as I say, this is a preview. I have not really justified for you this picture, and I will do so starting now. Let's see, do we have time? Yes, no, yes, yes, a little bit. Okay. All right. Okay, so now my task, I view my task now as justifying this much better for you. Okay? Oh, yes, but before I do that, <laughs> So what do you mean by the labeling at the word? Labeling at the, oh, I'm sorry. So, so the, the yellow, the yellow are supposed to be the actual polynomials. Uh, so please remember, I was saying earlier that usually oh, the way we specify uh, an element in, uh, in here is to actually just literally place a polynomial at each vertex. So this is F sub this, so this is supposed to be... So the is that a general or a general model or what? I just, oh, I'm sorry, okay, I should write this more. Okay, so in, so the yellow, the yellow polynomials together, this was meant to be simply an example of a class which is which satisfies the GKM conditions and therefore, by the theorem, is in the image of I star. One of the examples. It's just an example. I don't. I wouldn't. I this one I would not want to use as an as a module generator because it is non-zero at all vertices. Yeah, but it was. I'm sorry. So it was just meant to be an example of a class which satisfies the GKM conditions. Uh, uh, specifies a uh, let's see an, ele uh, an element in here which lies in in star it's just, I, I'm sorry, I didn't say it very well. It's in just an example. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. So now what I'd like to do is to try to connect what I have said in the past day and a half with what I said in the first day. 
So how is all of this relevant for this Schubert calculus, these grass linings, these Schubert classes, this Pieri formula, and all that, uh, all that material? How, how are these two things related? So this is my next topic. Okay, uh, so just to be concrete with everything that I say, I will only talk about, so, so one, one can talk about homogeneous spaces of different compactly groups. So you can talk about unitary group, you can talk about the symplectic group, you can talk about the orthogonal group, you can talk about the exceptionally groups, you can do whatever you like. Um, and, and people do. So, calculus. Just to be, but I put concreteness usually, and so today, and today also. And I focus on GLM, type A, Lee type A, okay? Uh, but please bear in mind, one can do the discussion of in other Lee types. Yeah, uh, okay, so. So depending on whether I want to talk about the compact or the complex group, I will, uh, I will sometimes say GL and sometimes I say U, but uh, they are, as of course, very related. So um, sometimes I am a little bit sloppy about which one I mean. Um, uh, so uh, IE, we type. Okay. okay, but one can do the discussion in general. Okay, so, so what am I trying to do? Um, so there's quite a lot that is well known about the T-act. Okay, sorry, I should start by saying there is a T-action on, on uh, the grass mining and their generalizations, the flag varieties, and there's quite a lot known about, about this action and the fact that it is TKM and so on. So this is what I want to review now. Okay, so please recall, but, but, but first what I would like to do is to reinterpret uh, some of what we have done in the first talk um, in, in terms of, in slightly more general terms that allow us to see the torus action and so on in, in, a, in a different way. Okay, so please recall from last time, uh, last time we were in this room, Okay, that the grass mining is by definition, so it's those subspaces, so the set of subspaces in CN such that the dimension, okay, C dimension is K. So I'm doing everything as complex in my world right now. Okay, and now the first thing to note here is that just by acting by linear transformations on the left, So just multiplication on the left. Okay, on this grass line, and in fact it's acting transitively. Okay, so it's a homogeneous space. What's the stabilizer of a point? Well, let's see. I'll take the stabilizer of the standard uh, k-dimensional subspace spanned by the first k standard basis vectors. So as usual, E1 and through En denotes the standard basis of Cn, and I'll take only the first k. Okay. So that, it's very easy to see. That's the, so the stabilizer of that flag is the parabolic subgroup. Of the following form. So I'll just write it out completely explicitly. So, so there's stuff here, things here, things here, and a zero here. And I have to tell you what the dimensions are. So this is, K, and that's 
k, and this is n minus k. Yeah? There's a k by k submatrix here, everything's zero here, and then here it can be whatever it likes. So this, and of course I have to be in g l n of c. Okay? So that's very easy to see, that's the stabilizer. So what am I saying here? Uh, I just wanted to point out that the glass lion is exactly, uh, which is to say another way of saying it is, Okay, so that's uh, just the way I want to look at it. And now it is clear that there's a torus action on the Grassmannian. It's just the torus sitting inside the GLN as a diagonal subgroup, and I just act on the left on the set of cosets. Okay? Alright, so now, I think I said this earlier, but I say it again. In modern Schubert calculus, the first day, we discussed the Grassmannian 2-4. I just want to say now that, in fact, uh, we like now to think about um, uh, also other, other homogeneous spaces of this type. 